Today on BRS TV, we're talking ultra low maintenance reef tank testing, and then you guessed it, giving away a Neptune Trident automatic testing station. I'm Ryan, your host of BRS TV Tank Trials, ULM edition. This is episode 19 of ULM and development of an ultra low maintenance system. The goal is a stable show caliber reef tank, which requires as little maintenance as possible, potentially only performing a few minutes of maintenance a month. Today we're going to share a handful of goal parameters and our testing plans for these three ULM tanks which certainly have different requirements as well as approaches. The four types of testing that we're going to consider are salinity because when salinity is off almost every element is likely to be off then major elements like calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium, nutrients like phosphate and nitrate, and lastly trace elements. Essentially the makeup or quality of the seawater in our tanks. I think all of us are making a solid attempt to maintain these elements at least somewhere near natural seawater levels and understand that testing is an important component of maintaining a healthy reef tank chemistry and in turn biology. However, not a single one of us wants to maintain a mountain of test kits. In fact, the perception that you need to test all the time is what prevents a lot of people from setting up a reef tank. So we're looking for an ultra low maintenance method which will reach our water quality goals but not take over our lives or cabinet, it really doesn't have to be complex. In fact, it can be really easy with the right approach. So starting with just sharing some of the goals for the parameters with salinity, we're looking to maintain 35 parts per thousand or a specific gravity of 1.026. Because this doesn't change a whole lot and because it's so easy to maintain, it often gets overlooked, but it's important to know that if you let it rise or drop 10% or so, 31.5 or 38.5 parts per thousand will mean every single element is now 10% higher or lower as well. That means calcium will drop from 420 to 378 or as high as 462. So maintaining salinity is really at the heart of maintaining every parameter in the tank. Look at the major elements like calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium, which are amongst the most rapidly consumed elements in the tank. We're just going to maintain a calcium level of 420, alkalinity of 8 dKH, and magnesium of 1350. One thing to note here is proportionally, there's much less alkalinity in the water, so it drops much faster, and why reefers almost universally agree, it's important to test for alkalinity more frequently than the other major elements. Now looking at nutrients like phosphate and nitrate, this one's a bit of a balance because higher levels can promote algae growth and maintaining near zero levels can potentially stunt coral soft tissue growth. This is a ULM and I'm not going to chase numbers here, but the general goal will be between one and five parts per million. In a closed system like this, really almost any level consistently above one part per million 24 hours a day means there's a consistent availability of nitrogen at levels higher than typical ocean values under one and we're likely in the territory where there's potential for the water to be nitrogen or nitrate deficient and I'll likely start feeding more or reduce some nutrient export methods. Over five parts per million in rising is a strong indicator that we're adding more nitrogen or nitrate to the tank than it's consuming and probably time to look at feeding less or increasing the efficiency of the nutrient export methods like the skimmer, refugium, water changes or carbon dosing. Now that said, this is one area where there certainly isn't a definitive answer of what the perfect nitrate level is. Many of the more experienced and adventurous reefers are experimenting with higher ranges with the hopes of finding additional growth, coloration, or maybe even general health benefits, particularly with SPS corals and how those higher ranges with nitrate balance with phosphate levels and even lighting photo periods or intensity. I will say those running higher nitrate levels successfully seem to have one thing in common, a stable, multi-year established tank, healthy microfauna population, healthy coralline coverage, and packed with corals. I'm sure there are some, but you don't see a whole lot of successful 6 to 12 month old tanks that are running what many would consider high nitrates of 10, 20, or even more parts per million. Similar to that is phosphate. In this case, higher levels won't only promote algae growth, but also promote slower calcification and coral growth rates. Similar to nitrate, absolute zero will limit the coral's ability to build soft tissue and potentially even other biological functions. There's a lot of conflicting evidence on what is the right level and where calcification actually slows down. In our case, I'm gonna shoot for 0.1 to 0.2 parts per million phosphate make adjustments to my feeding or nutrient export if I fall outside of that. 
If you are fighting an active algae outbreak, you may want to be even lower in the 0.03 range for established multi or successful reef tanks where algae and growth rates are really not a concern. Levels up to 0.5 are acceptable. In fact, don't be surprised if reefers share they've had success that might be even higher than that, like above one part per million. I do think it's worth noting that even though there are many fairly epic tanks with ultra high phosphate levels, even if it's not clearly identifiable, there are almost certainly some downsides to maintaining phosphate levels, which are many times, often a hundred times the levels found in natural seawater. More times than not, high phosphate levels like this don't begin intentionally, but more so the result of a gradually reduced maintenance schedule. Last in trace elements, I think there's some general health, coloration, and potentially growth value in at least attempting to maintain minor and trace element levels near natural seawater parameters. But not if it's going to cause you to play mad scientist by using tons of trace element elixirs or chasing numbers. I will share with you how we're going to approach testing trace elements on each tank. Starting with the softy and polyp tank, I think everyone is going to like the ULM testing plan for this tank and really gets to the heart of making wise decisions on the type of tank that you want to set up and matching it to the type of time investment that you have available to put into it. In this case, with the softy tank, we've already made decisions, which mean we really don't need to be overly concerned with testing at all. The soft corals and polyps don't consume many elements rapidly, and they tend to be more tolerant of a wider range of nutrient levels. So a tank like this inherently does better than others with a hands-off approach. This is my weekly, monthly, and quarterly plan for testing on the softy AULM tanks. At least once a week, glance at the salinity level on the apex to make sure nothing has changed. Something that I really didn't need to do because it would have sent me an alarm if the salinity was way off. So really zero testing weekly. Monthly, I'm going to test alkalinity. The most ULM method of testing alkalinity is a HANA DKH checker. It takes less than 60 seconds and gives you a digital readout. Nothing is easier. It also removes many of the procedural and color interpretation issues that other kits have. If alkalinity is on, I'm not going to bother with any other major, minor, or trace elements. Since the 3% a day automatic water change using the dose is approaching 100% water change over the next month, so provided the replacement salt water was mixed right, all of the parameters should be pretty close if alkalinity is. Also, once a month I need to mix up a new batch of salt water. This is where I'm going to test salinity, alkalinity, calcium, and magnesium after it's been properly mixed. Again, if I get this right, I don't have to be super concerned about the softy and polyps tank with an auto water chain schedule like this one. The salifer or Red Sea kits are pretty similar, but I'd go Red Sea just because the testing tools are better and the laminated instructions and plastic case are much better suited for an application designed to be used around water, often with wet hands. Then quarterly, just four times a year, I'm going to test nitrate and phosphate. Note that in the beginning, I may test these monthly, but long term, once the system is stable, I personally only need a quarterly pulse on this. Keep in mind that between the skimmer, out of water changes, and coral growth, nutrients are unlikely to get out of hand. In fact, it may be more likely that we use this data to feed more or adjust the nutrient export methods down. Again, the HANA checker is the easiest to perform and read for phosphate. And while the Red Sea kit is more accurate than others in the near zero range, for my one to five range, the NIOS is both the easiest for me to read and takes less time to perform. So that's it on the soft ULM, nothing weekly, monthly only alkalinity on the display, the big three on freshly mixed salt water, and the nutrients every few months just to get a pulse. If you want to test more, feel free, but I think a ULM system set up like this has intentionally made it possible to make testing just a few minutes a month. Next, looking at testing needs for the LPS tank, same methodology weekly, monthly, quarterly. This is going to change and get a ton easier in just a couple months with the release of the Neptune Apex Trident automatic testing station, but I'll share what I'm going to do for the moment until then. I'm going to glance at the apex salinity and test alkalinity once a week. Again, alkalinity really gives a pulse on the entire major, minor, and trace element uptake. Because it only takes 60 seconds to do a checker, I'm willing to do it weekly. In fact, I actually enjoy this one and have some anticipation associated to the weekly results because increased alkalinity consumption is often a strong indicator that things are going well, what you're doing is right, and the corals appreciate the effort. I'd also note that we're dosing Kelkwasser, which is an inherently balanced solution to calcium and alkalinity addition, adding equal amounts of both. So again, if alkalinity is on, it's very likely that calcium is on as well, almost certainly not way off. 
So monthly, I'll also test calcium and magnesium to make sure that they're on and make adjustments if needed. So not a lot of additional work. Lastly, quarterly, just a handful of times a year, test nitrate and phosphate to make sure those are on track as well. Again, I might do this a bit more frequently in the beginning, but in the end, it doesn't have to be all that often. We're not training to play that mad scientist here. Just keep them within an acceptable range or slowly correct if they fall outside of that desired range. Also quarterly or a few times a year, I'm going to send in a sample of my tank water for Triton ICP testing to review minor and trace element levels, or more importantly, how effective my approach is at replicating natural seawater. Reefers often think of these ICP tests as being associated with one additive system or another, but really every reefer out there will get some value from getting a much closer window into the actual chemistry of the tank. Prior to ICP testing, most of us were really just applying the pour and pray approach, just hoping what the manufacturers of all these additives told us was accurate. Now we can see a window into dozens of elements which play important biological roles in how these systems are actually performing. Like anything new to reefing, there has been some resistance to the ICP testing concept, some of which is because it doesn't have 100% perfect accuracy. However, that level of assurance in reefing really isn't obtainable in our hobby, and having this type of technology is unquestionably better than the fairly blind pour and pray approach most of us were using before. Particularly when you're evaluating for trends over time and not just a single test, you don't have to act on and probably shouldn't act on every last elevated or depleted level. Just monitor over time and make informed decisions. ICP testing is particularly valuable in a low water change environment or if you're dosing any type of trace element products where depletion and or overdosing are very real potential issues. In this case, we're using Red Sea trace element solution coupled with our Kelk reactor. We'll also need to occasionally manage elements like magnesium and strontium independently. While magnesium testing and dosing is easy and accurate, strontium test kits and dosing is not so straightforward. So rather than dose three capfuls every Tuesday, we can use the ICP report to dose the correct amount based on maintaining natural seawater levels. In the end, no matter what trace element solution or additive system you use, none of them will be perfect because they're all based on a theoretical mix of coral needs, not the actual mix of coral species that you have in your actual tank and the unique biology or uptake of specific elements. The ICP test will go a long way into clearing up that mystery. Okay, I mentioned the Apex Trident automatic testing. So for the sake of this video, I'm just going to pretend that it's already here because it's just a few months out and really the testing for the SPS tank will be almost identical to the LPS tank. However, in this case, this is what the SPS testing is going to look like with the Apex Trident. The Apex system is going to give me a constant pulse in the salinity. The Apex Trident is going to perform calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium tests automatically, daily, or even multiple times a day. Not only can I look at the results on Fusion on my phone, but I can see charts of how they change over time with zero effort other than changing out some reagents every now and then. Then send in the ICP test kit quarterly for minor and trace elements, and now the only test I'll ever be performing by hand is a single nitrate test kit every few months. Hold on to your armchairs and throw out your test kits because I think we just reached reefing nirvana. Seriously, not only are there near zero testing requirements to maintain a reef tank now, but even for those of us that were not doing them before, there's a huge opportunity for advancement here that just wasn't realistic before mostly related to daily or even multi-daily alkalinity testing. Let me give you two examples that are sure to open the doors to 100 ideas. I test the alkalinity on the BRS 160 daily. One day I extended the photo period on the 160 as well as turned up the lights, and then the next day the alkalinity dropped pretty drastically. And I needed to adjust the two-part dose. And guess why? Because I had increased the length and intensity of the lighting, which increased the rate of photosynthesis and the energy to provide the coral for calcification. Seems rather obvious after the fact. However, it could have just as easily gone the other direction. Overlighting the corals could have decreased photosynthesis and related calcification rates. In fact, on high consumption tanks, it may even be possible to track alkalinity consumption by the hour and find the actual lighting spectrum and intensity associated with the highest alkalinity uptake. Similar to that, we saw the same effect when we put the CO2 scrubber on the 160 skimmer. 
overnight the calcium and alkalinity consumption went up 50% related to the higher pH in the tank, cause and effect. So it's really easy to see how reefers can start to look into all kinds of aspects of reefing with a real touch point into if it produces legit results in terms of faster calcification. If you can't tell, I'm pretty excited and can't wait for the Trident release. This will almost certainly change how I reef, at least 100% from the aspect that other than occasional nitrate tests, I'm done with test kits forever. And that's absolutely a strong component of an ultra low maintenance system and what I want for these office tanks. So I'm told the Trident is going to be released in just a few months, but that isn't going to stop us from giving one away now. You won't get it until then, but you can lock down yours by winning this week's prize. So hit that link in the lower right or head on over to the site, hit specials and deals, and then free stuff to win. As always, if you like what we're doing here and want to see more, give us a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit that notification bell to be instantly notified when we release new reefing videos every week. See you next week with the next episode of Beerus TV Tank Trials, the Triton 160 update.